Hello everyone, so welcome to lecture number two. Today we're going to talk about atoms, molecules, and bonds. We're going to talk about subatomic particles, covalent bonds, hydrogen bonds. So um, if you haven't taken chem in a while, this will be a little bit to refresh your memory. And um, talking about bonds, it's important once we get to topics such as macromolecules, once we get a little more in depth with organic chemistry. So we really need to learn the basics um, today about um, atoms and molecules and the different types of bonds. So we're going to start with um, atoms. I'm going to erase all of this. We're going to start with um, something called subatomic particles. So we have these atoms or uh, these elements that you've seen in the periodic table. So the atoms are made up of subatomic or subatom particles. These subatomic particles um, are called protons, neutrons, and electrons. You probably remember a little bit about them, um, but they are will make up an atom. Okay, so we have in this case we have the protons in red with a plus, we have the neutrons in blue, and we have the electrons in gray with a minus. Okay? Um, so this is the nucleus. Remember we talked a little bit about the nucleus um, and all cells. So this is a nucleus of the atom, and inside the nucleus you have protons and neutrons. Outside of the nucleus, in the outer shells, what we call them, are the electrons. They're floating around. So when we're going to talk a little bit about atomic weight, most of the weight comes from the nucleus. Okay, The electrons are very light, and they're just floating around the atom, keeping that little distance and keeping some stability in the atom. So we have um, protons. So let's say they are positively charged. Neutrons have no charge. And electrons have negative charge or negatively charged. Okay, so we have a plus here, no charge, and we have a minus here. Okay, so to remember that. Um, now we have this um, electrical force or electrical law that we call in which positive charges repel. And we have unlike um, charges attract, or let's call this like. Like charges repel and unlike charges attract. So like is going to be positive plus positive and negative plus negative. Okay, that's how it means. Unlike charges attract. So what does this mean? Going back to our little picture, uh, let me erase this again. We have um, the positive here and the negative here. So these would tend to attract each other. So in order to keep the stability and the distance uh, between the plus and the minus, that's where the neutrons come. The neutrons have no charge and they would just attach to the protons in order to keep them from going into the neutron to the electrons or attracting the electrons to them, so this gives them that little st stability. Okay, um, so that's what this electrical force is for. Um, now we're gonna move into the periodic table a little bit. Okay, this is when it gets a little, a little interesting, and it may get a little confusing, but I'm really gonna try to be as clear and direct as possible. So we have. All these elements, uh, you remember about this periodic table, and we have different rows, we have columns, we have all kinds of uh, chemical symbols and numbers. So we're gonna uh, arrange this, so we're gonna talk a little bit first about one of the elements. So we have the chemical symbol here. I'm gonna zoom in a little more so you can look at this better. Okay, so we have the letter will dictate the chemical symbol. Okay, so this is a chemical symbol. Not every chemical symbol is the first letter of the element. 
Um, so we can have hydrogen with an H, carbon with a C, uh, boron with a B, but then we can, we can have something like silver with an AG or gold with an AU. So it's not always the same, but most of the time, the first letter of the element um, does give the chemical symbol. Now, we have the symbol here. I'm going hi to highlight this a little bit, and I'll change colors. And then we have what's called the atomic number here. Okay. So we have the atomic number. So this row is super important. We'll, we'll write this down. So we have um, the chemical symbol, okay. symbol. Let me scroll up a little bit as well. And then we're going to have the atomic number. And the atomic number equals the number of protons, which also equals the number of electrons. Okay, this is very important. So I'm even gonna fold this up and highlight and underline it. So the atomic number will give you the number of protons and the number of electrons. So whenever you wanna find out how many protons are in a certain element, all you have to do is look at the atomic atomic number. Okay. And then we have something else over here. What's called the atomic weight. It's typically on the bottom, okay? So this is our weight. Um, the weight is the number of protons plus the neutrons, okay? So let's write that down as well. So the atomic weight equals the number of protons plus the number of neutrons, okay? So, this little formula, I guess you can say, is if you wanna, if you have the atomic number and you have the weight, how many neutrons does that element have? So all you do is the 12 is the weight, the six is the protons, so transfer it over, 12 minus six will be six neutrons, okay? So it's a little bit of math, but it's pretty simple. So let's do a couple of examples. Um, so I can show you a little more. So let me just highlight real quick. Uh, so the weight would be here, just a couple examples, so you don't lose that. Um, it's important that you have a periodic table. You can have one like this and print it out and put on a Word document, or you can print one out. I would suggest printing one out so you can write all over it, and you can draw and color and get your little annotations. So when it comes to test time, you have that information with you. Okay, and it's more personalized to you and you're just not looking at this uh, table that may confuse you. Okay, so we have the number typically top left, a couple of examples, and then we'll have our um, chemical symbol, which is in the middle. Okay, so just so you know. And all the elements are uh, organized like that. Okay, so now let's move on. And zoom out a little bit. So quick question, how many protons are in sodium? Okay, so let's write this down. Sodium. So sodium, change that out. Let's find sodium in our periodic table. Okay, zoom in a little bit. Sodium would be over here on the left. That's not an S, S would be sulfur. We have an Na for sodium, okay? So the question was, how many protons in sodium? Remember, the protons is the atomic number. So sodium DNA has how many protons? We would have 11 because it's the atomic number, okay? Now, the answer would be 11. How many electrons are in calcium? Okay, so let's go back to our table, find calcium somewhere around here. And it's over here, calcium CA. Okay, so remember, protons is the atomic number. Now we want calcium. How many electrons? 
same thing, the atomic number. So calcium has atomic number 20. So it has 20 electrons. Okay. And the last, how many neutrons are in zinc? So let's go back to our table. We'll write down zinc over here. Zinc would be somewhere in the middle over here. This is zinc. So I'll highlight it um, a little bit so you, so you can see it. And now the neutrons, we're finding neutrons now. The neutrons would be over here. So we have weight equals protons plus neutrons. Or neutrons would be weight minus the protons. Or, since the protons are the number, the weight minus a number. So neutron, let's write that down so you don't forget. The weight minus the number. Okay. So for zinc, we have 65 as the atomic weight and we have 30 as the atomic number. So 65 minus 30, that would be 35. Okay. Pretty simple. Uh, feel free to pause it, to look at it again, um, to rewind it a little bit. And feel free to, to try new examples. Okay, so go ahead and practice a little bit. Uh, let's actually just do one more. Uh, we'll pick boron. Okay, and we'll do protons, electrons, and neutrons. So let's see if you guys got this. We'll try one more example real quick. Let's try to move on. So protons is the atomic number. Borons over here. We got boron over here. The atomic number is five. So we have five protons. The electrons is the atomic number, five as well. And the neutrons is the weight minus the number. Weight minus the number, which would be six. Pretty simple, right? Okay, so make sure you know that. And that's for all the elements. Okay, so we'll move on a little bit. Now, let me zoom out a little bit. Okay, so now to speak a little bit in general about the periodic table, we have this organized, like I said, um, by columns and by rows. Okay, so um, the number of electrons is going to be the atomic number, or the number of protons is the atomic number. So we have in all atoms, we have what's called electron shells. So those are little shells or circles surrounding um, the nucleus and that really compose the whole atom. Okay, So we have different shells depending on the number of electrons. Okay, So, um, for example, um, we need to write down a couple of rules in here. Okay, Let me move back a little bit. Let's take italicized out and we'll move on. So we have um, electron shells, that would be um, shells surrounding the atom where the electrons are located. So those are little shells around, those little circles around the atom, okay? The electron shells. Now, there are different levels, so in the first, so we can have a maximum of two electrons. Okay. In the second shell, max of eight electrons. And in the third shell, max of eight electrons. We, we won't get all the way to the periodic table and go too in detail, but these are the first three shells. So what, what does this even mean? Let's go back to our periodic table. Okay, so let's pick a number, a random number, and we'll say um, carbon. Okay, carbon is number six. Remember the number was the number of electrons. So carbon has six electrons, right? So it has six electrons. So in the first shell, how many electrons will carbon have? The most you can have is two. Remember our little rule. 
first shell would be two. So in the first shell, carbon would have two. In the second shell, carbon would have the leftovers or whatever is left. Since it only has six, it would have the other four. Okay, it doesn't necessarily have to fill them all out. It depends how many electrons it has. Okay, so um, for example, we can pick something a little bit more. We'll do um, sodium, which is over here, and it has number 11. That would be sodium. Okay. So we have sodium has how many electrons? Atomic numbers. So it would be 11. 11 electrons. Let me jump in a little bit so we get more room. Okay. So on the first shell, how many can we have? All of them can only have two. So it has the first two. In the second shell, it can hold up to eight, maximum of eight. So it would have eight. So that'd be 10. We're missing one more. So on the third shell, we would have just one, the leftover one. Okay, so that's the electron configuration. So I'm going to show you a couple images, and it's a little easier to see here. Okay, let's see if we have some examples that we did. So we can see carbon here in the middle. First shell, you have two. And in the next shell, you have the other four. Okay. Um, they, they did sodium over here. First shell, you have two. The next shell, you have two, four, six, eight. And in the third shell, you have one. Okay. So that's how um, these atoms are configured. Um, if you would look um, at some examples such as, let's see, we have on the right side, neon has 10. It would have two on the first and eight on the second one. So why am I telling you this? Because all elements or all atoms are trying to find stability by having eight electrons. So they want to be stable. They want to have a balance in their life. Don't we all want a balance in our life? So typically the ones on the right, which would be here, they all have eight uh, electrons or valence electrons in their outer shell okay so i'll go a little more in detail about that right now let me zoom out a little bit and we can continue moving on okay remember if you're if you didn't really understand it pause it or rewind it a little bit so you can look it over again now here is a quick trick in order to avoid counting and and what if we go through 85 are we really gonna have to go through every single shell nope um, first off, a couple of rules. The um, valence electrons, what's valence electrons? The electrons in the valence shell or the outer shell. So the valence electrons will determine the um, interaction of the atom. So the valence electrons will determine the interaction or the way the atom is going to move or what the atom is going to do um, in regards to combining with other elements. So the valence electrons, the outermost electrons, outermost, or the last shell of electrons. So, so I told you the first one would be two, then eight, then eight. So a little shortcut would be looking at these rows, at these columns, okay? So we have, uh, over here we have column one. You can see a Roman numerals on the top left. Maybe your periodic table doesn't have it, so it'd be good to add them. Column one, column two, and then we jump all these in the middle, which we don't need to worry about that. And then we have three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So a little chem hack or life hack um, these Roman numerals tell you how many electrons are in the outer shell. So we're not writing 2, 8, 8, 4, 16, whatever. Um, you just look at this, and it's going to tell you how many are in the outer shell. So for example, let's look at sulfur. Okay, that would be an S. It would be over here number 16. If you just go up, it is in column 6. So it has 6 valence electrons. 
atomic or six electrons in the outer shell. Pick any other one on those Roman numerals. Um, you could pick chlorine over here. Chlorine. And it is under Roman numeral seven. So chlorine has seven valence electrons. Okay. And I'll tell you why this is important. But we need to know how many electrons are on the outer shell. It determines everything. It determines how these atoms are going to interact, how these atoms are going to move, what they're going to do, um, who they're going to attract to. Okay, So that's super important. So how many valence electrons does carbon have? So let's go to carbon, which is right here in the middle, and it's under Roman numeral 4. So it has 4. Okay. <clears throat> now, this question is a little bit ahead. So we got um, atoms want to get to eight valence electrons to become stable or inert. This is what we call stable. What does it mean to become stable? Well, by having, uh, by not having eight outside, they're really looking to fill it up, either to fill it up or to give it away. So for example, we have um, some like hydrogen, which is on one. So what's easier, if they have one in the outer shell, what's easier, to get seven more or to give away one? Or in this case, since it's hydrogen in the first shell, we need two more. Um, let's talk about sodium. Sodium would have one outside. What's easier, to give one away or to get seven coming into sodium? Um, so typically, they want to either get rid of the electrons or get some more to have eight. Okay. So we have, say, for example, um, let's answer that question then. Um, how many electrons does carbon need in the outer shell to become stable? So we already said it had four. So in order to get to eight, it needs four more. That's simple. It really is that simple. We're talking about oxygen here. Uh, number eight, it has six. In order to get to eight, it needs two more. It's that simple. They're just trying to get a, they're trying to get to that balance. That's their whole purpose. Okay, trying to become stable, trying to get that stability. And sometimes they have to combine with other elements and take them or share them um, or give them electrons to become stable. That's really the biggest purpose of these um, elements. Okay. Okay, guys. So now we're going to talk about the types of bonds. Um, we're going to talk about covalent bonds. Um, this would be a good time to take a little break if you like. Um, and just kind of refresh your memory on everything else you just learned. Kind of pause it. It'd be a good stopping point um, in case you missed something or didn't understand something. Okay, so we're going to jump into the next part, and we're going to talk about types of bonds. So, as I was saying, um, all these um, elements are trying to get to those eight valence electrons to become stable. They are typically, we'll add a little bit here, um, they are non-reactive, okay? That means they don't really, the ones that have eight, they don't really want to react to anything. They don't really want to change. They really have that balance in their life. And we're talking about these over here, okay? The halogens over here, the noble gases, I mean. These are the noble gases. We're talking about helium, neon, argon. Um, those are the ones that are already stable. They already have eight. They don't really care about reacting with anyone else. They have their own business. Okay, so they're really non-reactive and stable. Okay, the ones that are that already have eight valence electrons. So now, in order for them to get to those eight, like we said, they need to share, give away, borrow. And when they do that, they make specific types of bonds. So the first one is going to be covalent. Covalent bond. Okay, so we'll do that. Take that away. We'll make them both. So we got covalent bonds. So covalent bonds is the sharing of electrons. Take the bold off of that. So the sharing of electrons. So instead of giving it away, they're going to be borrowing and sharing and letting other elements or atoms borrow some electrons. So that's sharing, because sharing is caring. Okay, so they're gonna share electrons in order to get that balance. Um, these are typically between non 
metal. Okay, what does that mean? In our periodic table, um, we have different parts over here. We can see here we have our non metals, which are the green ones. Okay, and we have hydrogen over here. So that's typically the bonds that these guys make. Why? Because they're trying to help each other out. They're in the middle. They almost have the similar ones. I mean, they have four. They're trying to get someone with four um, or someone with five. They can borrow a little bit or they're just trying to get hydrogen over here. So they're, they're typically covalent bonds are typically between nonmetals. Okay. And they share electrons. So here is an example. Um, we haven't really drawn anything. So let me draw something real quick. Um, the way we draw these um, atoms or these elements um, is called Lewis dot structures. Okay, so let me move back to my periodic table and just show you real quick. Let's pick an element, any element. So um, we'll do um, we'll, we'll do the picture that we have. We have carbon over here. So we have carbon here, okay, and it has four valence electrons or four electrons in the outer shell, right? Because it's under Roman numeral four. It's column four. So this is how we do. We do one, two, three and four like that you just go around if you would have seven you go five six and seven but um typically this is how we write them down why you'll see later on when we start combining these molecules when we start making bonds it's a lot easier uh, to see their interactions and to see how they bond so if we pick another element like hydrogen hydrogen only has one so hydrogen would be one okay that's how we would write draw hydrogen okay you pick any other one um chlorine fluorine and then seven so you go one two three four five six seven so that's how they're called lewis dot structures we're not going to get into detail but this is the simplest way of drawing um our elements or our atoms so now covalent bonds we'll talk about um single covalent bonds and where they share one pair of electrons so well, single means one pair double means two pairs triple means three pairs so as you can see here carbon we have carbon um i'll draw that as well we'll make it blue just like an image okay so we have carbon over here and it has four as we saw four valence electrons one two three and four so now in order to be stable it needs four more right because we're trying to get to eight so what does it do instead of getting an element with four it can combine with four hydrogens each hydrogen has one so let's do hydrogen red and what it does is we have hydrogen up here and then you get its little one from hydrogen there's one hydrogen you get its little one from the other one there's the other one or hydrogens why because now when they share them you're gonna have two four six and eight electrons so the carbon is gonna have eight and it's gonna be stable and each hydrogen is gonna have two remember our first shell was two of them so hydrogen is only in its first shell so all you need is two that's why it bonds with carbon a lot okay so here's a little example so now you could also draw a line between them, um, I'll draw with the highlighter, and a line would mean a bond or a sharing of electrons, okay? So there it is, those lines, and that's how we draw carbon or hydrogen. So that's just one example, we could do more examples, but here's um, examples of double and triple bonds, okay? So when they share two or three pairs. Um, we have oxygen over here, you see the little dots, one, two, three, four, Five. Let's look at oxygen. Let's see if we got that right. So oxygen, it's on the fifth column. So it has five, um, six. I mean, sorry, six um, valence electrons on the outer shell. It's in column number six. Okay. So coming down to our image, we have one, two, three, four, and we have one down here and one up here in those lines. So that would be six and six. So in order to be stable, they can share with each other, but they'll only share two. So that would have two, four, five, six, seven, eight, and this oxygen would also have eight. That's a double bond, or O2, oxygen. CO2, or carbon dioxide, 
uh, also has double bonds. The carbon, remember, has four, one, two, three, four, and it can borrow two and two from each oxygen. So now it has eight in total, and the oxygens have their two, their four, their six, plus the two from carbon. So they're sharing with each other. This, I think this image really helps us out up here. And there's some that may have triple bonds, like nitrogen. Um, if we go to our periodic table, nitrogen would have five on the outer shell, or five valence electrons. Um, so when it has five, we have two here and the three that are in this side of the bonds. This one now has two plus the three on the bonds. So when those three combine, two, four, six, plus the two little ones, that would be eight. So that's a triple bond, okay? Um, so these covalent bonds are the strongest bonds, okay? They typically have the most energy out of all the bonds. Um, now, there's another concept. So before we jump into the other bonds, there's another concept. It's called electronegativity. So this one's important. That's why I capitalized it. Electronegativity. Okay. What does that even mean? It's a big fancy word. Um, that just means how much pull. So how? Let me take off the bold over here. It just means how much pull an atom has on electrons. Remember how we're talking about some elements pulling and borrowing from the other ones. So electronegativity means how much influence they have or how much they pull other electrons. So the way we do this is um, in the periodic table from left to right, electronegativity increases. What does that mean? That means hydrogen, which is way on the left, has a lower electronegativity than helium. That mean that means hydrogen will have less pull or attract less atoms than helium over here. Okay, it's really more trying to get rid of his rather than pulling more towards him. It's not really a person, but the element. Um, also, electronegativity increases from bottom to top, so it's increasing electronegativity. So your top right has the most electronegativity. And we'll pick another color. Your bottom left has the least electronegativity. Okay? So that means they pull more or they pull less. So we're going to compare between uh, fluorine. Let's pick another highlighted color. Let's say fluorine and potassium. Which one has higher electronegativity? The one that's further to the top right. So fluorine would have a much higher electronegativity, which makes sense. Why? Because it has seven. Remember how it's on the seven column? So it has seven. So it needs to pull one more. It needs to pull one more. So there's a higher chance of it pulling one more than potassium pulling seven of them. Okay. So that's high electronegativity. So why does that even matter? Because in the covalent bonds or the hydrogen bonds, um, I mean, on the covalent bonds, we have nonpolar and we have polar covalent bonds. So first, let's uh, write down a couple of things I just mentioned about electronegativity. So um, increases from left to right, and it increases from bottom to top. So what does that mean? So that means top right elements of the highest electronegativity, the highest pull, okay, and it's, if it sounds like a fancy word, um, how much they actually pull, so the highest pull, highest pull, or the highest influence of pulling these electrons, okay, so now, why does that matter, let's talk now about, um, we have non-polar covalent, So what does that mean? That just means um, it is a covalent bond without much difference 
in electronegativity. So it just means there's really not a big difference in electronegativity. What does that even mean? So let's get to this. So we would have a nonpolar covalent. So remember, covalent is sharing. So when it's nonpolar, it's sharing. And say you have uh, carbon and oxygen, right? CO2, carbon dioxide. These two have, let's use a little pencil. These two have a very similar electronegativity. Right, because they're both on the top right. They're pretty close to each other. So they have similar electronegativity. So that's a nonpolar covalent bond with a small difference in electronegativity. Okay, so for example, let's put C um, with O. We can have um, N with O. Okay, so just a couple of examples. CNO and with O, they're both top right, have a small difference in electronegativity. Now we have the other one that's called polar covalent bond. Okay. Just so you can see the little image, polar covalent bond. See chlorine on the left um, and hydrogen on the right. So let's back to our table. Polar covalent is covalent bond with high electronegativity difference. Let me bring this down a little bit. See if that helps. Okay. So it means a bond with a higher electronegativity difference. So what does that mean? So for example, you have someone on the right, like chlorine over here, have chlorine over here and it wants to bond with hydrogen so chlorine is top right almost really top and it's really far right it has a lot of negativity hydrogen is way way left so it has least amounts of electronegativity so that just means their difference is really big and that's what we call a polar covalent bond okay so um covalent bond with high electronegative negativity difference so we'll do chlorine with hydrogen we can do um, hydrogen with oxygen so those are a couple of examples of course hydrogen oxygen would have two hydrogens make some water h2o okay so it's polar covalent um, and non-polar covalent and just in general a covalent bond okay. now Questions. Why do oxygen and hydrogen not share electrons equally in a covalent bond? And what is a specific term for this bond, type of bond? So oxygen and hydrogen. Let's get over here. Oxygen is over here. Hydrogen is over here. They share electrons, but they don't really share it equally. Why not? Because they're a different electronegativity there's a difference in electronegativity between the two that's why they don't really share equally um, so back to answering questions oxygen and hydrogen do not share equally because oxygen has higher electronegativity it's top right and it has a stronger pull so it's really kind of like this image right here this would be our oxygen and our hydrogen it's really pulling more so it's kind of taking it more than it should they're still sharing but this one's a little more stingy. It has higher electronegativity. That's all it means. On the other hand, we have the two hydrogens which share equally very friendly because they have the same electronegativity. Okay. And the second question is what's a specific term for this type of bond? So remember when there's a big difference, um, we would call it um, polar covalent bond. So it has a big, 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 big difference. Okay. So it's a polar covalent bond since the atoms are not sharing electrons equally and there's a big difference in electronegativity, okay? So now, um, this would be another pausing point if you would like to stop the video and uh, give yourself a little break, okay? Now, let's continue. Now we have ionic bonds, okay? So this is another type of bond. We had covalent bonds. We have 
Ionic bonds. Let's underline this since also important. Okay, so we have um, something that's called a cation and an anion. Okay, cation and anion. Go ahead and write those down real quick. And this would be a positively charged ion. And this would be a negatively charged ion. So what is an ion? Okay, so going back to our periodic table, we have our atoms. So let's get a cleaner periodic table. Written all over them. That's why I say if you have it in person, it's going to be help. Just write all over and have all these annotations. Um, okay. So, what does it mean to have an ion? So we have elements like uh, carbon, or let's say sodium over here. So we have sodium. Over here, okay. Sodium is has one valence electron because it's on column one, so it has only one. And they say we're going to combine it with someone that has seven. Let's pick chlorine over here. Change colors a little bit. So you have Cl. It has seven. So one. Let's make it a little bigger. One, two, three, four, five. Six, seven, seven valence electrons or electrons in the outer shell. So now, what is that going to do? Um, you're going to transfer electrons. So what's easier is for sodium to give the electron back uh, to chlorine so he can have eight and um, sodium can have one. Okay, that would really help both of them. See my cursor is being a little funky over here. There it is. Okay. So what is it going to do? It's not really going to share. It's going to give them away. So once it gives them away, it's going to lose an electron, and this one's going to gain an electron. So now, instead of having NaCl as atoms, perfect atoms, now we have an ion of Na and an ion of Cl. So now we have Na which gave an electron away. So now, remember how sodium would have 11 protons and 11 electrons? That would make it a, a net charge of zero. No difference, right? 11 and 11. But once it gives an electron away, now it has 11 protons and 10 electrons. So it's a plus one because it's a positive. It has more protons than electrons. So we would have Na plus, Okay. Uh, it's kind of like math where an X is a 1X, so a plus is a 1 plus. So it has a plus 1 because it gave 1 away. Um, and now we have chlorine over here, which didn't give any away. Chlorine received 1. So now it has chlorines over here in number 17 on the right. So now chlorine has... Um, seven, instead of having seven uh, valence electrons, it's going to have eight. It's going to be perfect, balanced. But also, um, chlorine's number 17. 17 protons, 17 electrons. Since it gained one more, now it has 18 electrons. So what does that make it? It's a minus one. So it's a negative. 18 electrons and 17 protons, the electrons win. So it has a minus charge over here. Instead of being a minus one, it's just going to be a minus. Sorry, that was horrible. So this is how we write our ions. Na plus Cl minus. Okay, that's an ion. So an ion is a plus or a minus where it gives away or takes away. An atom is just perfectly um, with the same number of protons and the same number of electrons. Okay, so now. A cation is positively charged ion. So which one of these two would be a cation? So we have our sodium is our cation. Why? Because it has a positively charged um, ion in it. It has a positively charged 
balance or um, it has a plus one in itself and our anion which would be the one with the negatively charged ion it would be our chlorine this is our anion okay. it's just a fancy way of of saying when the one that's plus and the one that's minus Okay, so if we have an example, say we'll do um, calcium. If calcium gives two away, let's pick a color over here, write it down. Say we have calcium over here. Remember, calcium um, has 20 protons, 20 electrons, but it has two valence electrons. So it would be one, two. If calcium gives two away, um, what would it have more of now, protons or electrons? So it gave two electrons away, so now it has m two more protons. So it would be plus two, or be two plus. That's really ugly. Let me write it better, okay? It's kind of hard to draw with, with the mouse pad. So we have calcium, and then we have two plus, and give those two away. Okay, so that makes it an, an, a cation with uh, two more protons than it should because it gave them away. Okay, so that's just a, an example. Um, say it gives them to, I don't know, oxygen. Now oxygen has a minus two because it gained, it gained two electrons. Okay, so those are ions. So let's go back to our little notes, um, our PowerPoints. So as you can see in this image, an electron is given away from one or to the other, and it makes it ion. Okay, so giving that away um, gives it makes it an ionic bond. So you can see in this image, we're talking about we have sodium here, has one on the outside, and chlorine has seven. So chlorine needs one more, so sodium gave it to chlorine. So example we did, and now sodium stable and chlorine stable. Na plus because it has one more, and Cl minus because it has one more electron. So Na plus because it has one more proton, and Cl minus because it has one more electron. Cation and anion. This is like a perfect picture. Um, so you can remember um, the ionic bonds or the attraction between ions of opposite charges. Now, how many electrons are in a sodium atom? Okay, so how many electrons are in a sodium atom? So if we go to our table, sodium's on the left. It has 11 protons. Let me get our highlighter in yellow. Sodium has 11 protons. It also has 11 electrons. Now, how many electrons are in a sodium ion? An ion will have 10 electrons because it gives one away. Okay, so that's the example we did of this sodium over here. It had 11 give it away so now it has 10 an ion so that's the difference between an atom and an ion okay so ionic bonds bonds created when giving away electrons okay <clears throat> atoms have same number of protons and electrons Ions have different number of protons and electrons. Okay, so those are ionic bonds. Now, again, you could get a little pause before we get to our last type of bond, and we're almost done. And we have the hydrogen bonds. Hydrogen bonds. Okay. So, our hydrogen bonds. Now, hydrogen bonds, they are pretty weak. Weak bonds. Let me take that off. So, they're pretty weak bonds. They are typically seen in water. Okay, so these are the weakest bonds of them all, but they're also very important. So they're seen in water. Okay, so now we have an example of hydrogen and oxygen. So let me go back to my table and draw something real quick. Okay, 
So we have water. We have oxygen in the middle. Remember, oxygen has six valence electrons. So one, two, three, four, five, and six. So now, in order to get to eight, it needs two more. So we can add two hydrogens. Make hydrogen green. We'll put a hydrogen over here. Put a hydrogen over here. So if it's one and an electron. Okay? So now we combine the two. That's a weird little line. And that would make, uh, I like that. Let's make it yellow. Let's erase that. That's a little bad. Um, we'll do some gray. So this would be our bond, and this would be our bond. So now it has two, four, plus a two, six, plus a two, and eight, and hydrogen has two and two. Okay, so that's our water molecule. So now, um, since they're sharing um, electrons, they're not really giving electrons. Remember, two nonmetals will be sharing. So we call these covalent bonds, okay? So we have covalents. Also, more specifically, they have difference in electronegativity because a hydrogen's on the left, oxygen's on the right, so it would be polar covalent. Okay. Now, since they're sharing, they're not giving away, they're only sharing, uh, we call this a partial plus or a partial minus. Uh, we do it with a little subscript S and a minus. And we do a little subscript S and a plus. Subscript S and a plus. So what does this even mean? So instead of turning into an ion because it gave an electron away or took an electron, it turns, it stays as atoms and they're sharing electrons, but they're partially negative and partially positive. Why? Because it gives negatives over here. So this one has more negatives. It's partially negative and this one has more positives. What does that even help in? What does that even matter? So hydrogen bonds have these really small bonds between them Remember, opposites attract. So hydrogen is slightly plus and oxygen is slightly minus. So they're really going to attract to each other a little bit. And it's going to form these weak little bonds. So those are the hydrogen bonds. Okay. So weak bonds. Um, bonds created by slightly negative positive atoms they're not really ions yet they're atoms okay um, so this hydrogen attracts really to this oxygen because it's plus and minus opposites attract like repel okay so those are the little bonds that are created those are hydrogen bonds you know we have that just in water but also in our dna and this is very important so this is a little more specific uh to our to your majors of nursing and getting more into the medical field. So we're talking about DNA, and we're going to split this DNA later on um, and talk about creating proteins. We're going to talk about um, transcription, translation, and reading the DNA. So remember, we have our nucleus and our DNA is inside, and it's very, very, very valuable to each cell. So we don't leave or take away outside the DNA. We make copies of the DNA. So in order to make a protein, um, our cell needs to read, or proteins need to read the DNA and split it in half. So let me pick a better color over here. And they're gonna split it in half. And they're gonna read one side and produce the other side as an RNA. And then from that, read it and make start making the proteins. So that's transcription, translation, which we'll learn later on. But it's really important to be able to break these bonds easily. So once they open up, we read them, and they come back together. That's the importance of these hydrogen bonds. So since they're weak bonds, they can easily break up, but also they can easily come back together. Imagine having a covalent bond in here. This would mean, remember, covalent bonds are the strongest of them all. Um, they're strongest bonds, and they have a lot of energy, so they require a lot of energy to break down. So it would take a while just to make more copies of DNA and make some proteins because they take longer to break those bonds. So there's hydrogen bonds in our DNA. Um, and last, we have hydrogen bonds in the proteins themselves. Okay, so you see the little lines down here? See if I can highlight them. 
So down here. Okay. So we have different amino acids um, combining. So we're going to also talk about these primary, secondary, tertiary, and quaternary um, proteins or processes of proteins. And they have the sharing of with hydrogen bonds also. So they're able to bend, to move, uh, to break if they have to. But they're a little easier to manage and manipulate than the covalent bonds. Okay. So now. What type of bond holds the hydrogen and the oxygen of a water molecule together? Remember what we talked about this? So let's go to our table real quick and end with this question. So hydrogen and oxygen, opposite sides, really different in electronegativity. Um, we're going to talk about, um, so we're, we're, what are we going to call this type of bond? Apologize. Um, hydrogen and oxygen, opposite sides. We go to our notes. It would be a covalent bond with high electronegativity difference. Right? This would be our polar covalent bond. High electronegativity difference, and it's only sharing of each other. Okay, so now when you have a water molecule and another water molecule, their little attraction is a hydrogen bond. Okay, so don't get that confused. Not because it's water, it has a hydrogen bond. The water molecule with another water molecule makes the hydrogen bond. Okay. So what type of bond holds the neighboring water molecules together? So those are the ones we just talked about, which would be right here. These little types of bonds that hold water molecules. Not hydrogen and oxygen, but the molecules themselves. So those would be our hydrogen bonds. So there is, um, we'll just add to this, hold water molecules together. It's also seen in DNA and proteins. Okay. So we talk about hydrogen bonds, ionic bonds, um, covalent bonds, electronegativity. Um, yeah, that's it for lecture number two. And Thank you for watching. If you have any questions, I'll see you on Wednesday.